I'm 24, and I'm standing in a massive conference arena in Birmingham. In front of me, there's a catwalk where six-foot models parade up and down alongside a rapper with his crew of dancers singing his latest tune. There's a big crowd around the show about to come onto the jean stand where I'm working. But I'm exhausted. My head hurts. My stomach's nauseous. So I run to the bathroom to splash cold water on my face. I catch sight of my face in the mirror. I look hungover. I've got pale complexion and red bloodshot eyes. I make my way wearily back to the stand where helpfully the models and dancers ply me with energy drinks and coffee for the rest of the day to keep me going. So on the drive back to London that night, I'm feeling my heart's racing. I'm feeling buzzy and quite charged up by all the change. I get home and my flat makes are up making pancakes. I add three or four tablespoons of sugar to mine and wash them down with several large glasses of dry white wine. At midnight, they disappear off to bed, but my head is literally bursting with ideas. So I grab a pen and a piece of paper and I start to write and write and write. The next thing I know, it's 7.30 in the morning and I'm late for work. So I run to my wardrobe and I pull out from the back a fake fur waistcoat, some red shiny flares and some high platform boots. And I run to the train station with this massive grin across my face, smiling at everyone I meet along the way. Later that day, though, my boss is driving me back across London and drops me off at my sister's. She puts me to bed after giving me a pizza margarita and a few brandies and says to me, I really think you ought to get some rest. I try, but I just keep tossing and turning. My body won't stop. So I get up really quietly and I creep out into the night. And then the voice kicks in. It says to me, You've been given a mission, and your mission is to put the buzz back into Britain. <laughs> we want you to help people put down drugs, uh, booze, and toxic food. But most importantly, you've got to help them with their self-worth and self-belief. And your mission starts this very evening by stopping in every petrol station en route to the local town centre to interview the night staff on duty. I'm asked to ask them, so, do you have any negative habits like smoking, drinking or overeating? How's your level of self-worth? And finally, in your opinion, how do you think we should put the buzz back into Britain? <laughs> I'm told to make notes from 1 to 10 on their replies. And next, I'm shown this red phone box and instructed to phone all the major London radio stations. I've got to tell them about the Buzz Back Into Britain event <laughs> being held that very evening. I dial the numbers, but weirdly, the line keeps going dead. By now, I'm being followed by two cameras from a UK famous TV reality show. They're filming my every move. And next, the voice says to me, you've got to find the buzz back into Britain party too, because you're the guest of honor and down to receive an award. So I start buzzing on loads of doorbells around where the voice tells me the party's happening. But again, nobody lets me in. And all I can hear are a load of people shouting and swearing down the intercom at me. Next, the voice tells me to go and take the camera crew to a patch of parkland off the main high street, where I'm told I can chill out and relax. And as I lie down on the damp, dewy grass and feel it beneath my back, I look up to the sky and suddenly, I have this marvelous picture 
Oh my goodness, I can see my two most favorite people in the world up there in the sky. I've got the Dalai Lama on this side and then Oprah Winfrey on the other. <laughs> But the weirdest thing, the strangest thing, is right in the middle of the two of them, there's me. Oh my goodness, that's me. And as I see myself on stage between Oprah and the Dalai, I feel like my body's getting lighter. I feel like I'm floating upwards. I feel like I can fly. It's amazing. I've never felt so much peace or joy in all of my life. I feel this inner release. The sun's coming up. I hear the birds twittering. I look at my watch. It's 7.30 again. The next morning, I make my way home. But when I come round the corner, I can see my mother standing on the doorstep. She's crying too, but her tears, they don't look like happy tears like mine. A couple of minutes later, I hear this piercing siren and suddenly this ambulance appears with a blue flashing light. I'm bundled in the back and 20 minutes later, we arrive outside this red brick, somber Victorian looking building. It's got bars on the window. And then I see the sign. It says, Psychiatric Hospital. 24 hours later, I'm laying in a single metal bed. I try to call out, but my tongue is numb and my lips won't form any words either. I try to get up, but my legs feel like they're concrete slabs. And then my memories start to slot back in or come back in. One by one, snapshots like on a cine film are flashing between my eyes. And then they're slotting into like a filing cabinet that's located into the top of my skull. Some of the memories I don't want back, but they come in anyway. And the more they engulf me, the more my body feels heavy, lead light, horrible. As I'm lying there and the memories come in, the sunlight is almost blinding my eyes. I can't bear to look at the light even. A few days later, a consultant psychiatrist says to me, you've had a psychotic break you've been sectioned, and you've been given a mental health diagnosis. But what felt even more devastating to me at the time was that my sweet and wonderful dreams were just a fictitious and fabricated fantasy, a grandiose and narcissistic delusion. None of it had happened, none of it was true. And in absolute reality and the cold light of day, I'd simply gone completely and utterly mad. I wish I could say that my madness ended there, but it didn't. I then spent another 10 years of total insanity, falling back into my old addictive patterns, a non-existent self-belief. My friends Pinot Grigio and Marlborough Lights came to the rescue, and I found comfort in sugar-laden sweet stuff that made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. I'd effectively spent from teenage years to my 30s on a treadmill, a self-destructive treadmill. Drink, smoke, eat, you don't have to feel. I tried to numb myself from my past and my psychotic break had tried to wake me up to it. But denial is a strong mechanism to break. And it took a wee while longer to even remember that mad night, age 24, let alone see any of its relevance. Finally, at 36, I entered another psychiatric hospital for my second stretch. It was for 10 years, and it was also a rehab on this occasion. But I was there, thank goodness, as a psychotherapist and an addiction specialist helping others. 
I came to see that my psychosis could have happened for a myriad of reasons. Differing theoretical fields vary greatly as to the exact nature or the cause. So much so that at the end of the day, I really found it hard to decipher. And at best, I could only ever c conclude or surmise. What I did come to the conclusion of was, for me, that my psychosis was probably triggered by earlier traumatic memories that I'd attempted to either block out or to hide. But for me, I also saw in that time that my madness wasn't the dreams or even the psychosis, in my opinion. My madness was I let the, the shame and the sense of unworthiness from those uh, earlier life traumas define me. That was my madness, spending so much of my adult years feeling unworthy, unlovable, not good enough. In my years of therapy with others and my clients, I came to see that this was a, a belief that they shared amongst them too. This collective defective madness of feeling like they were unlovable, unworthy, not good enough, when in fact some of them were amongst the most wonderful people I've ever met in my entire life. I could see their strength, and in their strength, they gave me strength. And I'm wondering, too, whether anybody in the audience today, whether you can relate, whether you've ever felt not good enough, unworthy, or unlovable. Because if you had, then I have to say to you that you're mad, too. <laughs> because believing in this highly contagious, toxic belief does stop us. It stops us from ever believing in ourselves. It stops us from being all that we can be. And it stops us from fo ever following our dreams. And that's sheer and utter insanity in my book. Isn't it yours? Several years after the psychosis, I found myself at a train station in a leafy London suburb. It was a cold winter's morning, but despite the noise, I heard this voice calling my name. I turned around and I saw this tall man in his 30s. He looked familiar. Oh, my heart sank. It was one of the male models who'd been on the exhibition stand that day with me in Birmingham. We engaged in small talk for a while, and then he asked me the million-dollar question. What happened to you after the Birmingham event? Where did you go? I decided to come clean. And as I got to the bit about the psychosis, his eyes widened, and he put a hand in front of his mouth. And he said to me, oh, no. Oh, my goodness, no, Lou. I know why. I know what happened to you. The models and the dancers that day, they put LSD into your drink. You were spiked. It did really answer a fair few questions. And I was really grateful that I bumped into him that day. But I'd spent so long holding the lid tight onto my pressure cooker life. I'm sure that it would have happened at some point anyway. So I don't blame the LSD. If anything, I thank it. Or I thank it at least for what it tried to show me. Although I have to say, I'm not advocating drugs. <laughs> Particularly given my profession. Definitely not. But what I am saying is that to live your life not believing in yourself is total madness. And I'm still questioning 
where is the line anyway between sanity and madness? Because remember the phone box and the London radio stations I phoned that night? Bizarrely, three years later, I ended up working for one of them. <laughs> and remember the TV film crew? Well, I ended up there six years later working with them, and I won an award. <laughs> and as for putting, helping people come off drugs, alcohol, and food, well, I guess that happened for the decade in rehab, didn't it? Albeit, I wasn't quite putting the buzz back into Britain, I'll admit. <laughs> so, please, today, stop living your life with the madness of the limiting beliefs about you not being good enough, about you not being worthy, about you not being all that you can be, because that is madness. And sanity, well, isn't real sanity about freedom from all this fear, freedom from self-imposed fear about who we are, so that we are free to reach up towards the stars and really follow our dreams. Because dreams, in my opinion, even mad ones, are crucial. They help us in so many ways. They help us challenge our limiting beliefs. They help us put down our self-destructive tendencies. They help us to overcome our deepest fears and to grow. But lastly, dreams, in my opinion, they help us to overcome so many of our deepest woes. And also, more importantly and finally, dreams really do come true when you believe. So please believe in your dreams. Thank you.